Reality is really complicated, and it's our job as analysts and scientists to build models that help us understand reality and explain it. And um, I'm going to today be giving a, a very gentle, and gentle being the operative word, introduction to Bayesian analysis. And the notebooks that I'm going to be sharing with you are essentially the things that I assembled while I was figuring this stuff out for myself. Um, so since what I'm going to be talking about uh, largely revolves around building models, it seems kind of prudent for me to firstly figure out how my mouse is going to work here. Uh huh. Okay, that's progress. Okay. So since, since I'm going to be talking about models, it seems kind of prudent to just take a step back and discuss exactly what a model actually is. And there's a very well-known quote by uh, this eminent British statistician, George Box, and there's, he says, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So if, if all models are wrong, why are we interested? Why do we contemplate building models? Well, there are a couple of reasons for that. The first one is to gain understanding. Right? So to interrogate a system. Another is to test our assumptions and hypotheses. And then finally, to, to make some predictions. So what then is a, a model? Right? It's, it's some sort of a, an approximation to a, a system. And it generally embodies a set of assumptions. Those assumptions may or may not be accurate. And Normally, it's formulated in some sort of a mathematical framework, and that framework has some parameters. And it's your role as an analyst then to take this model and derive the most appropriate values for those parameters. These parameters also mean that a single model can be applied to different systems. So for example, a binomial distribution, like a very standard statistical model, can be applied to the rolling of a dice or the flipping of a coin. And similarly, a normal distribution, well, it can also be applied to measurements of height and mass. It's just a question of choosing the right parameters for the model. OK, so how do we go about actually deriving the, the correct or appropriate values for these parameters? And there, there are two sort of competing schools for how one might go about this. The one is the, the frequentist, or in my mind, kind of the, the normal approach. And there. This is a couple of characteristics. Basically, if you're going to be taking the, the frequentist approach to fitting a model, you, you'd basically start off by selecting some sort of a hypothesis test from this enormous, complicated jungle of, of possible tests. And this is, this is the initial point where you can run into some stickiness, because unless you have a PhD in statistics, or the problem that you're working on is really simple, then choosing the appropriate um, hypothesis test can be a real challenge. Um, then, these hypothesis tests also generally make a whole bunch of assumptions, and one of them is that they are generally only valid in the asymptotic limit, and that is that you need a crap load of data for them to actually work really nicely. And then, when you actually apply the hypothesis test, you've got this result which generally boils down to a p-value, and this p-value, well, this has been the, the source of numerous scientific scandals, principally because the interpretation of a p-value is like, super tricky, and it's, it's actually really difficult to explain. And then furthermore, on top of all of this, you've got these kind of arbitrary thresholds, 5%, 1%, and if your p-value is less than one or the other, then you can accept the results or you reject them. It's, it's all it's terribly compl um, complicated and, and a little bit fraught. Okay, I, I don't intend to bash the frequentist approach. I'm just trying to point out that there are, are massive challenges. Okay, then on the other side, you have the Bayesian techniques, which are equally complicated, but are perhaps a little bit more flexible. For a start, you can safely apply your Bayesian techniques to a small sample size. They're very flexible, and, and the results that you get out of a Bayesian analysis are easier to explain. Like, you know, they're kind of more consistent with what people imagine the statistics to mean. Okay, so supposing for a moment that we're going to turn our backs on the frequentist approach and start doing Bayesian analysis. Where, where does this all begin? Well, kind of the workhorse behind all of this is Bayes' rule or law or theorem, and, and this is what it looks like. And 
I'm going to just briefly discuss the, the various components of Bayes' theorem. O over on the right-hand side, we've got two components. Um, I'll begin on the right-hand side, P of theta. This is what's known as the prior. And this basically, it's a, it's a prob probability density function that captures what we know about the model parameters before we actually analyze our data. So this is our, our preconceived ideas, or maybe even based on previous studies, of, of the distribution of our parameter. And then next to that, we've got the likelihood. And the likelihood tells you what the probability of your data is, so your new observations, given a particular value of the parameter. And then over on the left-hand side, we've got the posterior, and this is ultimately what you're aiming to get. This is the, the distribution of the parameters once you've actually ingested the data. And then there's the denominator, which is known as the evidence. And, and it's of all of these components in Bayes' theorem, it's the denominator that's the most difficult to evaluate. And as we're going to see, to make this entire Bayesian analysis thing possible, we have to find a, a cunning way to get around the evaluation of, of the evidence. Okay, so I kind of briefly talked about the prior, saying that it's what we know about the the parameters before we start. Generally, this is going to be wrapped up in, in some sort of a statistical distribution, and you would normally select from one of the standard distributions, like a normal or a beta or a uniform. So you have something that looks like one of these possible distributions. And these basically say, tell you what's known about your parameter before you start. Okay, so we're going to just take a quick look um, at how one might go about simply applying uh, Bayes' theorem to a very simple problem. I think something that we can all identify with, and that is flipping a coin. Any kind of uh, result that has a, a, bi a binary outcome. And our coin flipping data has got to consist of zeros and ones, and the zeros are going to represent tails, or a negative outcome, and the ones represent you know, heads, positive outcome. And our objective here is we're going to try and fit a Bernoulli process model to this. And a Bernoulli process is super simple. It has two possible outcomes, 0 or 1, and a parameter, theta. And what theta is, is the probability of you getting a 1 or a heads. Right. Now, if we were to take the frequentist approach with this data, we'd just say, OK, I'm going to just calculate the mean of those zeros and 1s comes back at 0 0.75. So immediately, based on, this, on these 20 coin flips, I would say, wow, this coin seems a bit funky, right? I would expect it to be closer to 0 0.5. Right? But we've only got 20 samples, so there must be some degree of uncertainty around this estimate. And, and you certainly, from a frequentist perspective, you can quantify that uncertainty. But as we're going to see in a moment, taking the Bayesian approach gives you a very nice idea of what that uncertainty looks like. And we're going to start off by adopting what's known as the good approximation. So what we're going to do is take a, the range of possible values for theta, obviously 0 to 1, and we're going to divide it up into a very fine grid, and then we're going to evaluate Bayes' theorem at every point in that grid. And we, we know what the prior is. We're able to evaluate the likelihood, and consequently, we can get the posterior over that grid. But since, since we're talking about the good approximation now, it's maybe an idea to think about how this approximation would scale to a model that has uh, multiple parameters. If you have, say, two, three, four, five parameters, then suddenly your parameter space has a whole bunch of axes. And so the number of points in your grid then scales as the power of the number of parameters. So suddenly your simple linear grid becomes this multidimensional monster with like potentially lots and lots of points in it, and the entire situation becomes computationally intractable because now instead of evaluating a couple of hundred um, uh, Bayes' theorems, you're doing it now for many, many, many times over. Okay, so in the long run, for more complicated models, the grid approximation doesn't work, but it's very nice as a starting point to gain some understanding. So what we're going to do is just create a, a grid of values for theta, and then set up a prior, and the, the prior in this case is just going to be completely uniform. So we're going to assume that every value of theta has equal probability. Now, I, I think that if you contemplate this for a moment, 
then this is a completely absurd thing to do, right? I mean, no, no matter how biased your coin is, there's, there's no way that theta is like exactly the same for, for all possible values. That, that's, just, that's just crazy. But that's where the frequentist approach starts, right? So the frequentist approach starts with this like blank slate. I know nothing about this problem, and then I'm going to digest the data and come up with the result. Okay, so we now have a function that essentially evaluates Bayes' theorem. So it takes and it consumes the prior, uh, our vector of theta values, and k, which is just a 0 or 1, depending on the outcome for a single flip of the coin. So we run that. And now what I'm going to do is execute a number of iterations of applying Bayes' theorem. These are known as Bayesian updates. So you start with your prior, you take a chunk of data, you calculate the posterior. You take a look at the posterior, and then you take it and you feed it in as the prior to the next iteration. And every time you do this, you're consuming new data, and your new posterior should become closer and closer to the final result. Okay, so what this does is it just applies our Boolean, our Bernoulli model, and then generates a series of plots. And this is what it looks like. So in the top left-hand panel here, the dashed horizontal blue line, that's the prior, the uniform prior that we started off with. And then we have our first data point, which was, if we go back to our data, it was a one, meaning that the first time we flipped the coin, we got heads. Now, immediately, this tells us that our coin is not completely biased or that it doesn't have tails on both, si both sides. Right? We know that theta equals zero is an impossibility. So our first posterior update looks like this, right? It's zero for theta equals zero because we've already now ruled that out on the basis of the fact that we've observed one heads. And it's linear and basically says, okay, the, the probability of theta increases as theta increases. Let's consume our second sample, which now happens to be tails, right? Now, we've eliminated the possibility that our coin has two heads, right? We don't have a coin that's got to give us heads every time we, f we flip it. That means that clearly theta is not one either. So after this, we end up with a very special posterior, which I am calling the McDonald's posterior. <laughs> and, and then you kind of, you keep on iterating. Every time you, you iterate, you consume a new piece of data and you take the posterior from the previous iteration becomes the prior from the next iteration. Consume data, you get a new posterior, and you iterate until you end up with your final result now, which gives you the probability density function of theta based on your data. And, and if you scrutinize this carefully, then you'll see that the peak in this distribution is above 0 0.75, which is kind of consistent with what we got out of the, the straight-off frequentist approach. Now, the nice thing about this approach to, to modeling is that it's very easy to swap out one model and pop in another one. And there's a great alternative to the, Bern to the Bernoulli model, and that is the binomial model. So instead of considering each of the coin flips individually, we kind of group them all together and say, okay, we're going to have a, a single experiment in which we have 20 trials of which 15 were successful. We treat that as one lump. And so now I have a new function here that, that does precisely that. So we have a new likelihood. This is now based on, on uh, the binomial model. But we are also going to have a slightly more sophisticated prior. And in this case, we're going to use the beta distribution as a prior. And the beta distribution is, is most appropriate in this situation because it has support over the range from 0 to 1 and it's not defined outside that range. It has two parameters, alpha and beta, and the choice of those parameters will determine the shape of the beta distribution and, and hence the prior. So let's evaluate that and now try this out for data and we're going to do this with, okay, so not using exactly the same data as before. Now, 10 trials, seven successes. We have the solid, the horizontal blue line. That
our uniform prior, we get that by using a beta distribution with alpha equals one and beta equals one. So this is just as uninformative as where we started before. And you can see, in this case, we end up with the distribution that's most reminiscent of what we got when we had started off with the binomial of the Bernoulli, Bernoulli distribution and the uniform prior. But now, if we think about the situation and say, okay, this uniform prior is completely absurd, we, we can do a lot better than that. Let's try for something that's weakly informative. So a prior that's zero at the two extremes and kind of peaked in the middle, and we can get that with a beta distribution alpha equals two, beta equals two. Okay. And now, once again, dash blue line is the prior, the green is our likelihood, and the orange line is the posterior. And what you can see is that instead of the posterior being lined up over 70% in this case, it's shifted ever so slightly over to the left. So what we have here is that our prior knowledge about theta has actually moderated the impact of our observations. But even this is not terribly good because I, I'm pretty sure that my, my knowledge about the way that coins work is not that vague. Right? I have a very strong feeling that theta should really be somewhere pretty close to a half. So maybe a prior like one that you'd get with a beta distribution, alpha equals 20, beta equals 20 would work better. Right, and in this case, the dash blue line, our prior, you can see now it's kind of constrained to the range between 0 0.4 and 0 0.6, which I think is pretty reasonable for any coin, even if it is a biased coin. You're not going to get away with something outside of that range. Okay, and then we have the likelihood, the green line, and our posterior, the orange line. And here you can see that our existing knowledge about the coin has really, really had a major impact on the final result. And if you contemplate this for just a moment, it seems pretty reasonable, right? The frequentist approach, you start with this uniform prior, you're basically saying, I know nothing about coins, and I'm gonna trust these 20 observations to inform my outcome. It's kind of crazy, right? We know a lot about many physical systems before we even make observations of them. Okay, time for me to move on to something different. Oh, actually not. So before I do that, just to mention, for, for doing Bayesian analysis in Python, there are, there are a host of different packages. So there are these first five. They're all implemented in Python. And then there are the latter two, so PyJags and PyStan. And these are actually wrappers around other systems. And I'm going to be focusing kind of right at the end of this talk on PyStan. Okay, so I mentioned that this grid approximation doesn't work when you scale your problem. So how do you, how do, you do better? How do you deal with the multidimensional problem? Well, back in, in I guess, the, the Second World War days, they were, they were doing some very uh, intensive work uh, on the Manhattan Project, and, and one of the things that they had to do was evaluate these massive multidimensional integrals. And so they invented a very cunning process called the Monte Carlo process. And initially, this was just to evaluate integrals, and it involved, rather than trying to evaluate these integrals across a grid of points, basically taking random samples from that integral and getting an approximate result, but at least getting a result in a reasonable amount of time. Now, the, the one thing that you need to be able to do to apply the, the Monte Carlo method is to be able to take your density function and invert it, so basically turn it inside out and that then allows you to generate samples from the distribution. Since we don't know what our posterior looks like, we can't inverse it, right? So that's already out of the window. But fortunately, there's another thing that comes into play here, and that is the idea of a Markov chain. Now, a Markov chain is a process in which the next step depends only on the current conditions. So in like a really simple and idealized case, like the weather for tomorrow is going to be much like the weather today, and it's not going to matter what the weather yesterday or the day before was like. Right? Today's conditions are the only things that influence the weather tomorrow. Highly idealized. These two things together are going to allow us to, to solve a, a multidimensional problem. Okay, so let's just do that. And we're looking at exactly the same data set as before. We're going to be applying a Bernoulli model. 
look at the frequency stuff, we have exactly the same mean as before, so 75%. We can calculate uh, a confidence interval on, based on that, and that's like making some pretty um, dodgy assumptions. But let's move past that and, and talk about maximum likelihood. And this is kind of something that's, that's also in the, the frequentist regime, but it relates to this quantity likelihood, which is maybe worthwhile going back to. So what the likelihood is, as I mentioned before, is the probability of your data given a particular value of, of a parameter. So what you're doing is you're looking at each individual observation, so each coin flip, and you're saying, okay, if, if theta is 0 0.5, how likely is it that I get heads? And how likely is it that I get tails? And you do that for each individual observation, and you end up with a probability. And we know that probability is going to lie between 0 and 1. And to get the joint probability of all of those observations, so your entire experiment, you have to multiply all those probabilities together. And you know, if, you, if you've done computer science, then you'll know that you take all those small numbers, you multiply them together, and you end up with a really, really small number, which is probably going to result in an arithmetic underflow. So from a computational perspective, this likelihood is a little bit fraught. So what's normally done is rather than working with the likelihood, you do the log likelihood. So you take the logarithm of each of those probabilities and instead of adding, I mean, instead of multiplying together, you just add them together. So I have functions here for both the likelihood and the log likelihood, and I'm going to plot them out for that data set. And you can see on the left here, the likelihood has a very nice peak above 0 0.75, so it gives us exactly the same results as we got from just calculating the mean, right? Find the maximum likelihood, and it's a little bit more difficult to identify, but the, the maximum and the log likelihood is at exactly the same point. In this case, you don't get arithmetic underflow because we've only got 20 samples, but if you have 100, 1,000 samples, definitely it's not going to work. Okay, so the next step, taking the Markov chain and Monte Carlo and mashing them together so that we have a way of doing these uh, Bayesian analysis. And this is basically, there's a, a very simple uh, iterative algorithm for how this is done. So you start off with a sample for theta. And this sample can be just completely taken at random or can be extracted from your prior. And then what you do is that in the vicinity of that sample, you now choose a new value. And this is known as the proposal. And it's a very conventional way of doing this. Is you just sample a little normal distribution around the current location and you effectively do a random walk. So you've now got the current value of theta and a new value of theta. And you now need to make a decision about whether you're going to accept this new value of theta or not. And in order to make that decision, you need to look at the posterior probabilities of those two points. So you evaluate the posterior where you are now, you evaluate the posterior where you're potentially going, and then you form the ratio of those two. Now, the cool thing about this is when you form that ratio, the likelihood, which is in the denominator of Bayes' theorem, doesn't involve theta, so it just poof, disappears. Most magnificent. So you have this ratio, and then what you do is, if the ratio is one or greater, then you immediately accept the new location, and if it's less than one, you accept it with a probability of r. And this is just done by simply generating another random number by between 0 and 1. And if that random number is less than r, you accept. Otherwise, you reject. Right. Let's see how this works in practice. So we're going to set up a prior, which is going to be a beta distribution. Just to remind you, that's what it looks like. Quite nicely peaked around 0 0.5. And then I have a function here which implements that precise algorithm that I was talking about a moment ago. And let's evaluate that too. And I've also got another function which is going to give us a little bit of diagnostics as we go along applying the algorithm. And we're going to kick the process off by just generating a sample from our prior. So this prior.rvs is going to just sample from the prior. And so this is the beginning of the sample chain in our Markov chain. And the variable posterior is going to be a list to which we're going to add successive samples from the posterior. Right, so let's do our, our first iteration here. So we're, we're taking the, the posterior that we've just generated now and we're feeding it into our, our function that's going to be doing the stepping. Why are we doing this? Because we, we need to know what the most recent value of theta was in order to generate the step. Right? 
So we evaluate that, get a little bit of diagnostics and, and some plots. And these plots give us three things, like the prior, the likelihood, and the posterior. But importantly on them, what we have is the, the vertical solid line is the current value of theta. The vertical dashed line is the proposal value. And the, the important panel for us here is the posterior here, where we see that the posterior for the proposal is greater than the posterior for the current value. So that ratio is greater than one. So immediately, we accept that new location. So on the right hand side here, in this trace plot, we have the current value and the new value. Right, so let's have another iteration. Once again, there's our current value over there, which is pretty close to the peak in the, in the posterior, and there we have our new proposed value. Now, in this case, the ratio between the posteriors there is going to be less than one because the, the posterior at our proposal is less than the posterior at our current position. And in fact, this is the, this is the ratio there, it's 0 0.44. And now we need to make a decision about whether we're going to accept it. So we actually sample a random number between zero and one, which turns out to be 0 0.39. It's less than the threshold. So again, we accept the proposal. So we've now got three points in our trace. And we iterate this a couple of times, and each time we iterate, we get a new value for theta. All right, we've got a whole bunch of ones that have been accepted. Oh, incidentally, uh, this may not come as a surprise, but the, the green dot indicates acceptance. The red dot indicates rejection. So let's, let's examine this case. So here we have the current value, solid line, proposed value, dashed line. The ratio is less than one. Here, in fact, the ratio is 0.22. We sample a random number, it's 0.82, it's above the threshold, so we reject. And in this case, because we've rejected the new value, we just retain the current value. So on our trace plot here, we can see that the new value is precisely the same as the old value. And you can continue iterating like this. Every time you iterate, you generate a new value. Now, of course, doing it like this and generating plots on every step is highly inefficient. So what you'd really want to do is go and generate a whole great big bunch of samples without any diagnostics. So I'm now generating 5,000 samples from the posterior and turning those into an array. And now I have my posterior distribution. Now, this maybe requires a bit of, of explanation. With Bayesian techniques, you don't actually get like a density function out for the posterior. What you get are samples from the posterior. But because you've got all these samples, and the density of the samples is the same as the density of the actual density function, doing a histogram, for example, tells you exactly what that posterior looks like. So we can do that immediately now. We can take a look at the trace for all 5,000 samples and also the distribution of the posterior samples. And we can see that if we just taken the frequentist approach, this would have been peaked at around 0 0.7. But now, because we had a strong prior, it's moderated the influence of the data. And consequently, our ultimate results is peaking up around 0 0.6. Um, one thing to be aware of, and that is that if, you, if you're now taking the, all of these samples, right, from, from the trace, and you think about applying sort of standard statistics to them, statistics where you're assuming that each of the samples is independent, then you're going to run into trouble, right? Because the, the very nature of a Markov chain is that there's a very strong dependence between successive samples. And we can quantify this by looking at an autocorrelation plot. And here you can see that for all the way up to like lag five or six, there is a significant correlation. So this needs to be taken into account if you're doing any further analysis on these samples. And a package like STAN will actually tell you, will give you another parameter. It'll say rather than using the number of samples, use the effective number of samples, which takes into account the strong autocorrelation between successive samples. Right. Now, because we've got this posterior distribution, it means that we can go and actually generate new samples. And this is one of the great attributes of a good model, and that is that it should be generative. You know, you, you have a model, and you can make new data, which you can now 
uh, compare with like, new observations. And we can do this very easily. We can do it as a, as a one-shot process, you know, generate a single sample from the posterior, or we can generate a, a whole bunch of these. And the nice thing about this is this is not like just going and saying, okay, um, I've, I've got a, a Bernoulli process and theta is 0 0.6, so give me samples your theta actually has built in an uncertainty. So you have the model uncertainty and you have the parameter uncertainty and you're getting that entire package together in your, your new posterior samples. Um, a, a more sort of practical component about this is that for computa computational purposes, it actually makes sense, both from a, a statistical perspective and also from a compute perspective, to run multiple chains in parallel. So if you've got a four-core machine, it makes sense to rather than just launch one very long chain, launch four chains in parallel, and then use the data from all four of those chains. And that's, setting that up is very straightforward. Even for this simple example, you would then end up with, in this case, I've got four chains executing, and you then end up with four data sets, and you just aggregate the resulting data together. But, okay, so it's just a question now taking all of these samples and merging them together to create one massive sample set from the posterior. Another thing that's worth knowing about is that at the start of your history, you can actually see it quite clearly here, we've got a s couple of samples that appear to be kind of, well, especially these ones over here, they look like they're outliers. And this is because y when you kick off your Markov chain, it's probably very far away from kind of the equilibrium distribution. So normally it takes a good number of samples before the Markov chain actually sort of settles down into a state in which it's producing meaningful data. So what's normally done is that you have this burn-in phase, like some fraction of your data, say 20 or 25%, that you actually discard on the assumption that the model hasn't actually converged to a stable state yet and the rest of the data is then what you actually retain for further analyses. Okay, so that's how we would do all of this if we were going to be doing it from first principles. And something that I didn't mention is that, that the algorithm that I've been describing is what's known as the Metropolis-Hastings algorithm. So this was the, the first one that was, has been developed. It's, it's perfectly functional, but it turns out that there are a lot more efficient ways of doing this. So for example, there's Gibbs sampling and there's this the um, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, which are basically ways of, of sampling from the posterior that are just a little bit more efficient. And th the biggest differentiator between them is the way that the proposal is, is being selected. Okay, so let's now talk about this tool, this, I beg your pardon, this tool, tool, um, Stan, and it's named after this guy, Stanislav Ulam, who was most... Uh, <laughs> instrumental in, in the Manhattan Project, and um, he, he, he came up with the idea of Monte Carlo method. STAN is a standalone program, and what you have to do is you need to write some STAN code, which STAN then takes and converts into C++, and that C++ is then compiled, which means it's got to end up being super efficient, and then you then run the resulting binary on your data. So here, the, the compute intensive part, generally, is actually compiling your STAN model. Once you've got that model running it on your data, unless your data is enormous, is normally pretty quick. This is what um, a basic STAN file looks like, and there are um, a couple of components that are mandatory, so the, the parameters block and the model block, and the rest of them are optional, and we're going to see in a moment uh, an example of, of what a, a STAN file would look like. So getting this up and running in uh, Python, super straightforward, pip install PyStan, and you're ready to roll. It will go and install STAN for you as well, so the entire system will be set up. I, I'm not sure, on a Windows machine, I suspect you may need to install a separate C++ impiler, compiler. If you're on Linux or Mac, you're good to go. Okay, so an example of how STAN would work in practice, we can look at another Bernoulli model. So here is our data, so a whole series of zeros and ones. And here is what our STAN model looks like. And the, the important components of this model are the parameters and the model uh, blocks. The parameters essentially say, okay, what, what parameter are we solving for? It's, it's a real and it's going to be called theta, and we're confining 
it to lie between zero and one. And then in the model block, we say, right, we have heads are gonna be given as a Bernoulli distribution with parameter theta. And we then provide a prior for theta. You don't need to provide a prior. You, if you don't give it, it'll just assume a uniform prior. But of course, we now know that this is a very poor place to start. And then at the top here, we have the data block. And this essentially sets up the interface between Stan and Python. So it says that we're going to be accepting an integer n, which is the number of samples, a vector with n elements, the heads, uh, the heads or tails, and then two uh, real numbers, a and b. And those are going to give us the shape of our prior. We then do the computation, the in intensive part, and that is actually compile this model. And, and this takes, well, for that simple model there, it takes about a minute. Once it's built, you can actually go back and take a look at what the underlying C code looks like. And it's a bit of a mess. It does some pretty fancy template metaprogramming in order to get some really, really efficient uh, binary performance. I honestly don't see any reason why you'd want to dig into that. Um, and then we can go ahead and run this model. So we have to set up a dictionary that does the translation between data and Python and data and Stan. And you can see there's a one-to-one -one mapping between the, the keys in the dictionary and the variables in my Stan file. And then we go ahead and actually run the model and we can take a look at the results. Right? It comes back with a nice uh, model summary here telling us that the estimated value for theta for that data set is 0 0.47 and there's some very beautiful diagnostics for it as well telling you what the distribution of theta is from each of the individual chains it lets you take a look at uh, a trace plot and and then also importantly you can actually access the underlying samples and you can ask questions from it like what is the probability that theta is greater than 0 0.5? And that's very easy to evaluate. Theta are samples from the density function, so we just subset out those ones that are greater than 0 0.5. This gives us a long Boolean vector. We calculate the mean, and that's the, the component of the tail of the distribution that lies to the right of, of 0 0.5. Okay, I realize I need to wrap things up now, so I'm going to do just that. Um, so, in conclusion, I'd really encourage you that if, if you're doing any kind of modeling at present, just check out what the options are uh, in the ba Bayesian space. And I would really encourage you to start with Stan for a number of reasons. Firstly, the, the documentation for Stan is, is really pretty good, especially compared to the other, other players in this space. And the, the user community is very, very vibrant and extremely helpful. The nice thing about these little stand files is that you can start off with a super simple model and basically incrementally build up a more and more uh, complicated mo model as your, as your demands increase. Um, it integrates nicely with Python, as we've seen, but also importantly for me, plays nicely with R and Julia. And um, there's uh, an annual conference, not surprisingly, known as StanCon. And like, also, most importantly, just learning new tools is cool. Thank you very much. That's great, Andrew. Thanks so much. I think um, it was a very pragmatic approach to delivering some meaty content, so that, that was great. Thanks. Um, is, the, is the notebook available online? Not currently, but it will. Well, it, can we try to put it on the website? I think it would be really nice to, to sure. go through that at leisure, and I think that would be great. Um, cool. Do we have any questions? Go for it. Hi. Um, I just wanted to know, how do you know when the Markov chain what heuristics do you use to determine when the Markov chain has converged? This is a super good question. So there, there are some analytics that are built into Stan and that are exposed in PyStan as well that allow you to determine whether your computation is converged. But this is also an area of some uncertainty because I mean, it's an active research topic at the moment. You know, how do you know that your Monte Carlo model has actually converged? But there, there are some existing tools that will at least give you a pretty strong indication that your results are robust. Cool. So every time I look at Bayesian, my brain explodes, and I'm slowly getting there. Um, I have so many questions, so I'm going to boil it down to one. Do you have a book that kind of deals, or a website or something besides what you've done, that kind of deals with um, uh, Bayesian models in a really pragmatic way? Oh, um, yes. Aha. So this, 
this book listed second from the bottom there called a Statistical Rethinking by Richard McElreath. It's super good reading. Mm -hmm. um, it is, it's an R-flavored book, but it, but it translates very nicely to Python because, I mean, you've got big chunks of stand code and then R is just really the driver to run that code. So, um, and yeah, I would thoroughly in encourage you. So basically everything I've spoken about here is, I, s I guess, probably maps to chapter one and chapter two in that book. And then he goes into great depth and explained really, really beautifully about a whole range of other Bayesian topics. Holger. Cool. <laughs> Thank Hi, Andrew. Um, thanks for that talk, great talk. So I have a couple of things I'm, I'm wondering about. The one is how to choose which prior distributions you, you have. So the answer I've gotten to that before is to choose whatever is sort of mathematically convenient, it works out, but maybe that's not very satisfying, so maybe you can shed some light on that. And also, how do you choose the parameters for your, for your prior? I mean, it's, in the case of a coin toss, maybe it's obvious you would start with assuming that it's a 50-50, but in a more complicated model, uh, I find that very, very hard. Um, and finally, like it seems a bit arbitrary to kind of stop there. Like those parameters on your prior could also have their own distributions. Um, can you <laughs> maybe comment on that? So I, I'm always a little bit worried when Helga gets the microphone because I know he's going to ask a challenging question and now he asks three. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, to address your first question, how do you choose a, a prior, I, I guess that, that my approach would be sit down think about what I know about the problem, sketch out what I imagine the prior would look like by hand, and then look at a, at a book of distributions and find something that looks similar. But I mean, very often it's pretty obvious, you know, like for, for example, if you're, if you're solving, solving a, a binary problem, you know as a starting point that theta has got to be between zero and one. So that significantly limits the, the choice of, of possible priors. Um, your second question was like, how do you evaluate the prior? Now, I, we've kind of touched on this idea of doing a, a posterior check, and that is that you, you, you've got the posterior, you can now generate samples from the posterior, and you can compare those to the original data and to new observations. There's also this idea of doing a, a, a prior predictive check, and that is you, know, you have a prior, you evaluate that prior, you take samples from it, and you just see whether they're consistent with your intuition and consistent with your existing data. And I forget what the third question was. It was uh, about the parameters of the prior. Like, yeah. they could also have <laughs> a distribution. Mm. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I yeah, don't see sure. that being done a lot. I'm just wondering if that's... No, uh, exactly. So you can build a hierarchical model in Stan where, you know, you have distributions upon distributions upon distributions, yeah. for sure. Um, so uh, that was very informative. I'm still getting my head around it. Um, but uh, often models are not as simple as just a coin toss. <laughs> so <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, obvious. Um, but so how would you go about um, scaling this up, adding um, now a new variable, and what is your intuitive feel for the limit of how many variables you can add, especially if they're interdependent? Um, I, well, to answer the second question first, um, so McElroyth in his book talks about models that have thousands or tens of thousands of parameters. So I think that it's, it's perfectly feasible to build models like that and Stan. Okay, cool. <laughs> that sounds hectic. <laughs> <laughs> it does rather, yeah. And, and with regards to, to building more complex models, um, so one of the, the selling points to me with Stan is that it makes it very easy for you to kind of incrementally build a model. So, you know, start off with something basic and then gradually refine it. And I suppose that you'd only stop when the quality of the predictions coming out of your model are kind of consistent with your, with your existing data. Okay, I think I've got an idea. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? If you if you want to read find out a bit more about this, the, there's a podcast called Data Framed. 
And their, their latest episode is with uh, Andrew Gellman, who's one of the prominent figures in Bayesian statistics. So that's also something you guys can check out. Uh, otherwise, let's thank Andrew again for his presentation. Thank you.